Good afternoon. Ms. Terry, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Sunday worship service of Fessy. This we're praying, praying that this week I get to see my doctor and I get released where we can come back after Fessy, but we won't know that till Thursday. But pray for us that we get a clean bill of health and that come back this Sunday coming. Because we miss being in fellowship with you in person. There are so many other people who still look at these messages that have been too fast, who've never been fast, but are still looking at them. So it's important we get them out. But it's important to us to be back in a personal relationship with, with worshipers at fast. Today, we're going to look at, uh, we're still looking at Saul of Tarsus. We're looking at him going to Jerusalem today. But th this is a slide I've used before. It's really important. This is a depiction of the Apostle Paul. And it says, the Apostle Paul entered heaven for the cheers of those he martyred. It says that's how the gospel works. Now, we, we need to understand that we're called to be holy. And the only way we can be holy is through the shed blood of Christ. But there's many things that uh, we're, we should be doing that we're not doing because we, we hold a grudge against different people. I and mean, we should hold a grudge against them. But there's things going on in the world today that just can infuriate you. But we have to step back from it and it's like, you know what? God's in control of this. And even though it looks like Satan's winning or Satan's making the decisions, in the end, it's all going to be to God's glory. No matter what happens, it's going to be to God's glory. So before we get started, we're going to be in Acts 9, uh, 26 through 31 today. If you want to open your Bible up, you have it. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll get started. Father God, we thank you for this start. We thank you for the message we heard just a few minutes ago. The Lord God, we ask for an anointing and blessing on this message today. We're Continuing through in, in chapter 9 of Acts, we're looking at the change in, in Saul of Tarsus into Paul the Apostle. We're looking at Saul who was held the, the clothes, the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen to death. And we look at him persecuting people's way, members of the church. And he even got a letter from the high priest to go to Damascus and bring back anybody he found who was followers of the way, followers of Christ, bringing them back to their uh, to Jerusalem. The Lord Jesus knocked him to the ground, blinding, and he was converted on the spot. And we won't go into all of it because you can look at the last three messages and you'll see the whole story is spelled out to you. But this is Saul going to Jerusalem. But the Lord Jesus went to the cross of humiliation for all who would believe. You know, there's there's people that take that that last three words, well, four words, all who would believe. That's who he died for. He died for those who would believe that he was the virgin born, sinless crucified, risen Savior. If you believe that, then you'll be saved. You'll be in God's good graces. But most people won't leave that part off and they just want to go to the Lord Christ Jesus went to the cross of humiliation for all. But it's all who believe. We have to believe in faith that Jesus is who he says he is. So, so that all who believe will be saved from the second death, which is an eternity in hell, as we read in Revelation 20, 14 to 15. It says that Hades, or death and Hades, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that's not a, that's, that's just flat out promise from God's word. That's what's going to happen to all unbelievers. And Prayerfully, next week I'm going to be doing a message on the two judgment seats that either believers or unbelievers are going to have to go to. And it's, I pray that it's a, a message that opens up people's eyes and hearts to the truth. But remember, 
It's the object of your faith that's important. Not how you lived or died, or how good you were. And you talk to people, we just speak for Christ up to say, well, I'm, I'm a good person, I do this, I do that. But that doesn't get you into heaven. That just gets you the good graces of men. And when you get the good graces of men, you're still lost if you don't know Jesus. But the object of your faith must be the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and the empty tomb. But if the object of your faith is not the completed work of Christ on the cross and the empty tomb, you may still be lost in your sin. And I, I, when I wrote my notes, I said you may still be lost in your sin. If you don't believe in the complete work of Christ, you don't believe in the empty tomb. You are lost. You know, maybe lost. You are lost. Because you can't be saved by a Savior that you don't believe in. But it's not your manner of death that makes a difference in your eternal destination. When we see people, let's say somebody dies in a car wreck or something else, or they've been sick for a long time and they die. And the first thing you want to say, well, comfort and say, well, they're in a better place now. Maybe not. If they didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, they're not in a better place. They're in eternal torment. And that's the thing is, that's why it's so important for the gospel to be preached and witnessed to because we don't want anybody to suffer in the eternal torment of hell. But we don't sugarcoat it either because we want people to know what the truth is. We want people to know that without Jesus, there is no way. Jesus said in John 14, 16, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if, if you think you can get there another way, you're going to set yourself up for a, a bad fall. But don't be found getting ready but be ready for the judgment. Acts 9.26 says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, and he did not believe he was a disciple. Can you actually blame the people of Jerusalem where Saul started his reign of terror on the church, on people who falls in the way, on Christians? That's where, he, that's where he got started, and he went to Damascus from there. So the Disciples, they had a natural reaction to not trust him. But as I said, it's, it's no wonder that the disciples in Jerusalem were cautious about Saul. They must have been wondering whether his conversion was actually an attempt to infiltrate their ranks. Was he trying to come in as a spy to spy out their leaders to get them all in one place so that he could get them all at one time? Who could blame them? Because his terror, his run of terror against the church started in Jerusalem. They were the ones with first hand knowledge of the evil he could unleash on the people of the way. So you know, we have to cut him some slack initially because when we're, we're in a position that someone who's been an enemy to begin with, we have to be a little cautious when we decide to, to embrace him because they might have a knife in hand sick in their back. And you can see that, that they were cautious. But in Acts 9.27, we have a we have a different take. But Barnabas, and you remember back in chapter 4, and we'll read about it here in a second, but Barnabas got a good reputation among the apostles because he had some property and he sold it and he laid the, the money at the feet of the, uh, the apostles to take care of the needs of the church. But let's see, 927 says, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And that's what what Barnabas was good about. That's what his reputation was, that he was he was a son of encouragement. That's a nickname the apostles did, and we'll look at that in a minute also. But Barnabas, who had the gift of encouragement, saw Paul's true heart and defended him to the apostles. We know previously of Barnabas, as I said, from Acts 4, 36 and 37, 
And it says, And Joseph, who was named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now Barnabas was well thought of by the disciples in Jerusalem and and would, as we see, come to Saul's defense. He came to Saul's defense not because not out of loyalty to Saul, but because of the fruit of the Spirit. Because he could see what happened once uh, Saul was converted on the road to Damascus by the Lord Jesus himself. He saw that. He saw what happened to him when he was filled with the day of sight and he was uh, preaching the gospel in the synagogue and preaching the gospel to Jews and to brothers in Christ. He saw that and he stood up for him with the apostles because they could have shown him also. The fruit of the Spirit since his encounter with the risen Savior and his conversion on the Damascus Road was the proof that Barnabas had. But as we'll see later in Acts, Paul and Barnabas make one crackerjack mission to him, one on a mission to spread the gospel throughout the known world. And they, their ministry was fruitful, though they had a lot of difficulty along the way, which when you follow Christ, you, everything's not going to be rosy all the time. You're going to have troubles, you're going to have tribulations, you're going to have trials. Satan, is, if you're successful in what you're doing, Satan is going to be doing whatever he can to, to disrupt it and break it up. So when you, when you witness to somebody for Christ, don't get so hung up on that rosy picture of being a Christian without telling, hey, you know what, you follow Christ, then you're going to make the enemies to say you're going to be, be put upon for one way or another. But praise God, if you're in Christ, you can never be touched by Satan unless you give him an entryway. Amen. Acts 9.28 says, So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. This is important because Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the early church, he is now Saul who's preaching the risen Savior, and he's preaching it to Jews and it causes a problem. But when it says coming in and going out, what it's saying is, is it signifies his acceptance because he could come in where the apostles and disciples were, he could come in, he could go out, and there was no difficulty. They didn't cringe every time he sent walking the door thinking, well, this is, is this the day that he's going to do his dashing deed to us? He was accepted, and they, they accepted his testimony. But he was able to freely come in and out of fellowship with the disciples. And while he was in Jerusalem, we will see the hellish Jews start to grow weary of him. Remember, we said last two weeks that when he came to faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, his Jewish buddies thought he was a traitor. They were upset with the church, but they were more upset with him because he was the one that hit. His whole mission was to destroy the church, but he, he can convert it. But the hellish Jews, like as I said, they were starting to grow weary of him. For just like the young Stephen at his stoning, he was becoming an irritant to the powers that be. Saul, Paul, Saul Paul's encounter with the risen Savior and his analysis emboldened him for the work, the work of spreading the gospel to the end of the earth. The carnage he had inflicted on the church must have driven him to be a, ze be a zealous for the church. And that's a, that was an important thing about Paul the Apostle. As, as he was doing his ministry against the church, and that's what it was, it was a ministry, it was calling, whatever you want to say, he was zealous for that. But when he was Converted on the Damascus Road, he was more than doubly zealous for the church. He was more than doubly zealous to spread the gospel. And that's what he did. That was what his whole mission was the rest of his life. Once he was knocked to the ground and was testified to by Jesus that he was persecuting him, that, that he couldn't kick against the goats, and that he had a calling for him, he never looked back. The only time he looked back, who he was, was to say that all these things were 
for work is made without Christ. As I said, the carnage she had inflicted on church must have driven him to be zealous of the church, which means preaching in anticipation of his imminent return. Jesus' imminent return. Never letting the witness opportunity pass. But what does imminent mean? What does imminent return mean? It means that Jesus Christ could come back at any time for his church. There's nothing that's got to happen. Nobody else has got to be saved. Nothing. But when God's perfect timing Times out, that's when Jesus is coming. But there's nothing else that we have to do. There's nothing else anybody can do. And it's all dependent upon God's time table. But Paul would do more things with the gospel of Christ than any preacher in this country that I know of. All is not lost, though, because there are pastors, Bible teachers, enduring severe persecution. We have pastors in this country that have been prosecuted over helping homeless people and different things, but in places in Africa, uh, Pakistan, India, we have Christian pastors and, and members of the church who are being persecuted hard that we have people who are being executed for their faith, thrown in prison. So it's not, not that severe here, but if we don't keep our eyes on the prize, it could get that way before we know it. And you've got a lot of people who sit in church that would just be just as happy to sit at home and watch a football game or something or watch the Olympics than do what, what they're called to do. So those people who, who are sitting home watching the Olympics and football right now, instead of being in church somewhere, they are being easily manipulated to follow with the Antichrist. But are you pressured by someone to deny your standing in Christ or to go a different way? Never cave to the prodigies of the devil to disobey. We as the church need to major in the gospel and not get fixated on minor differences that don't matter. And that, that's a problem for the, the universal church. We're not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. We're not talking about anybody. We're just talking about the body of Christ. And the body of Christ you can't get fixated on little differences, little different stance in worship or little bit of dark. It, as long as you're still in the same thing, virgin born, sinless life, death on the cross, and the risen Savior, if you still have those, and then you don't have anything else that has to be done, then you're all right. But what happens is you'll have people, and, and Paul had to put up with, his, with himself, you got people saying, yeah, Jesus, all those things that you say about Jesus is true, but you also have to do this. There's no buts. There's nothing else. If you, if you believe that in your heart and you know that Jesus Christ has saved you and forgave your sins, there's nothing else you need to do. If you go to a church that says, Jesus is fine, but then you need to find a different church. You know, pastors are leaving the pulpit because they feel unappreciated and stressed or because someone licks the red off of their lollipop. They just can't stand the lack of respect for their opinion. Sticking to big biblical principles may not always be the popular thing to do, but that is depending on who you are trying to please, God or man. Are you trying to please the man or the woman sitting next to you? Or are you trying to please God with your worship? But it's not about what I think, but about what God says and expects through his in our word. Now, if we're called by God to preach and teach, he will empower us through the indwelling Holy Spirit to do that. He will give us the words to say to impact the lost and dying world. Now, Acts 9, 29, it says, And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord, being Saul. He spoke he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the hellas, but they attempted to kill him. Who didn't see this coming? We have already looked at the fact that the Jews looked to Saul as a traitor to the Jewish religion. I say religion because they had done the same things day by day for hundreds of years with no positive effect. All of their traditions were not of any permanent value as far as salvation goes. 
the law and the Old Testament sacrificial system only identify the sin and point us to Jesus and his cross, but not salvation. Stephen had also invaded the heaven's shoes and paid the ultimate, paid the ultimate price, but received his reward, a much greater reward than his killers could ever imagine. In a sense, Saul, who held the cloak to those who stoned Stephen, picked up where Stephen left off. He was preaching the gospel without concern for the consequences. That is how we are to share the gospel without compromise of the God's word. We're not to take the gospel and change it where it's acceptable to somebody. And that's, that's a sad fact, too, is we have churches who very people, they don't expect you to change. They say, just stay as you are. You don't have to change. We'll, we'll take you like you are. As long as you sit in the seat every Sunday and you put your money in the tithe. But that's not what, what faith in Christ is about. Faith in Christ is about being holy. And in his relationship, it's not your own. And we can't dilute the gospel to make it pleasing to somebody just because we want them to for financial reason. Acts 9.30 says, When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Now when the brethren found out there was a great, was a threat to Saul's life, they took action to preserve his life, preserve his life and his testimony of what Jesus had done on the Damascus Road. Now Paul's testimony is critical to the body of Christ because of all the evil he did against the church. Some people we witness to resist because of evil they have done in their past. Nobody has done more evil against the church than Saul of Tarsus. But yet he was con convicted and converted on the Damascus Road. Which means that no matter how bad you've been, there's still a chance to faith in Jesus Christ and the virgin born, sinless, crucified, resurrected Savior. If you believe in that, you can be saved no matter what your past is. Now, I'll say that because Jesus, when he went to the cross, he, he paid the penalty for sin. That penalty was the second death, which we've already looked at. The second death, which is the lake of fire, which is in, in hell. He paid that penalty, but he hasn't paid the consequences. So if you're a murderer and you come to faith in Jesus Christ, that still won't stop you from being executed or in prison for life because that's what you did on this side and the legal system's going to take care of that. But when you, when you cross over, you'll still be going to the uh, to heaven because you were redeemed by the blood. But some people we witness to, as I said, resist because of the evil they've done in the past. But the life and ministry of Paul, Saul Paul, shows us that no one is beyond the redemption of the Lord Jesus. In AD 32, Saul was at the stoning of Stephen, as we read in Acts 7 58. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of the young man named Saul. Witnesses is a kind of word used to identify those hellish Jews who stoned Stephen. During the years of 33 to 34 AD, Saul was engaged in pers persecuting the church. Saul was exposed to the testimony of Stephen at the stoning, at his stoning, and the testimony of those he put in prison. Paul's testimony about himself can be studied in Philippians 3, 5, and 6, and it says, and this is Paul talking about himself, Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal of persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is the law of blameless. What Paul saw Paul is saying is he filled all the squares to be a follower of the of the Torah, the law, what it the temple and all that stuff. He, he was perfect and all that. But all that was 
not worth anything because none of that would save you. None of that would redeem you. All that was is filling squares, trying to be good to placate God. And that's what the Jewish religion was, especially this time. They weren't looking for a savior. They weren't looking for their the Jewish side. They were looking for a military, political leader to kick Rome out of, out of uh, Israel. But that's not what Jesus came for. But all the things that qualified Paul as a, as a good Jew discounted were discounted by his faith in Jesus Christ. In AD 34, Saul encountered the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus and is converted. He also travels to Arabia. Now in Galatians 1 and 17, it says, Saul states, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. AD 37, Saul returns to Damascus, then exits the city for his safety from the Jews. When we read scripture, we sometimes miss the point that all these events may be over several years. Paul, it seems to me, most of the Jewish leaders, most of the Jewish leaders he preached to, upset with him because they didn't want to hear about Christ. They were upset by him just as Stephen had done earlier. Paul was, it seems, always being sent away for his safety from the anger of the Jewish leaders. However, as long as he was involved and came to work, his life would be preserved until the end. Either by the brothers in Christ, the apostles, and even the Holy Spirit. But that never prevented him from being stoned, beaten, and put in prison. And ultimately having his head, head removed. Now Acts 9.31 says, then the churches throughout Judea, Galilee, Samaria, had peace and were, were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Then the churches had peace. The peace was not solely due to Saul's conversion, but it was a big, big point of it that it freed him up to, from persecution. But what really did it was Tiberius, the emperor of Rome, had died around this time. He was replaced by Caligula, who wanted to erect the statue of himself in the temple of Jerusalem. So the Jewish energy that was being expended going after Paul to kill him, it was being drained away to something else. But the Jewish energy was directed away from persecuting Christians towards Caligula. Here we see God's sovereign work at hand, giving the early church a short season of respite. It will not last forever because the cross of Christ is foolishness to those perishing as we read in Paul's epistle to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, amen. Paul suffered greatly for the cause of Christ, and I believe as a consequence of his persecution of the church. And I said that earlier, that everything that Paul did before had to be accounted for. All the apostles abandoned Jesus to the cross, except Apostle John, he, he stayed close at hand, and he even went in with him. And he was at the cross, he was everywhere he could be while Jesus was being tormented. He was the only one of the apostles who did die a martyr's death. He died an old man's death. Now, he had some tough times getting to be an old man to die, but in the, at the end of everything else, he was not martyred for his faith. He was, like I said, he died an old man's death. But for Paul suffered greatly for the cause of Christ, and I believe the consequences of persecution of the church. We are saved through the blood, the shed blood of Christ. But that does not relieve us of the consequences of our transgressions against God's law. Do you know this Jesus that Paul preached? Don't leave here today without it. And I, I don't have it on the slide. I couldn't get it on the slide, but I'm going to just review it down and close in prayer. 
It talks about a timeline of, of Saul of Tarsus. It says AD 32, he was president of Stephen Stone, which that's Acts 7 58 and 8 and 1. 33 to 34 AD, he was a persecutor of the church. That's Acts 8 1 through 3 and Philippians 3 6. AD 34 also was the year that he was converted under Damascus Road, 9, Acts 9 1 2. One through nine. He goes to Damascus, travels to Arabia, and remains there in Galatians 1 17. 36. And in 36 AD, he's imprisoned by Herod Agrippa. 37 AD, he returns to Damascus. The city of safety. Galatians 1 17, Acts 9 20, 25, and 2 Corinthians. Then he goes up to Jerusalem. Calligraphy becomes an emperor at the death of Tiberius. Saul goes back to Tarsus for safety at 9 30. When you read the scripture, just read it. It seems like a lot of things have happened. Boom, 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 boom. But there's a, a, a time that goes into that. And eventually, Barnabas is sent to check on the church today that had been uh, started, and he, he thought enough of, of uh, Paul that he went to Tarsus to look him up to bring back. That's how they got started on their, their uh, team, on a mission team. But what we need to realize is that we're all called to share the faith in Jesus, in Jesus Christ. We're, we're called to tell people about it. We're not called to be undercover Christians, we're called to be out in the open blunt Christians, and when I say blunt, we need to tell the truth, not try to sugarcoat it, and get somebody, get someone to accept. What we need to do, they need to accept the truth of what the gospel is. Just as Jesus was was persecuted and suffered, and all the apostles except for, for uh, John were abused and uh, Mark, uh, that, that happened to us. There's Christians every day around the world who are being martyred for their faith. And I, I quoted last last week's message, uh, Tertullian, and I'm um, paraphrasing, said that uh, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And that's what happens. The more the church is put under stress, the faster it grows. You know, when you break a bone in your body, when they said it, they don't set it right back in the, just like where the break is, they kind of put it off a little bit. Because what that does is that causes stress on the bones and the calcium deposits build up and heal that bone. And that's what the church is when, when, when bad things happen to people in the church. That stress makes the ones who, who are left and the ones who are coming up stronger and more bold in their witness because that's what we're called to do. Jesus left, when he left us, he didn't say, man, I think it's going to be great for you if you follow me. All, all the good things are going to happen to you. What he did promise us was that we were going to have an eternity with him in heaven. And that's more important than anything we suffer here. Let's close in prayer. Let's make the last slide. My life was headed straight to hell until Jesus came to save my life. Thank you, Jesus. I think there's one more. So the Bible is being played out before our very eyes, yet most people are blind to it, just as the man with the paper burning in front of him. We need to look at what's going on around us. As I said, I mean, there's not one thing that has to happen before Jesus comes back to the church. But we don't know how bad things are going to get before that happens. Because there's some horrible stuff going on in the world. There's some horrible people in charge of it. But well, still, again, we need to know and take heart in the fact that Jesus Christ is still on his throne, and he's the one who died for us. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we are able to still get this out. And Lord, we pray for all the students of Christ, and we pray for them to do well in their studies this week. We pray that this storm coming through won't be much 
for the winemaker. The Lord God will lift them all up to you because everybody needs Jesus. There's nobody who doesn't. And the problem people have is that they've been seeing Jesus in the church discounted. And the church has discounted itself with, with some of the things they've done. There's churches out that shouldn't be called churches. They should be called. I don't know what it should be called, really, truly. But we need we need to be strengthened by each other and, and walk with Christ. We need to be ready to share our gospel whenever the opportunity comes. We're always to be ready. We're always to share and do the things that we're, we were called to do. And that's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.